Hey guys, I want to talk to you today about the sponsor for this show, which is Aura. And I want to let you know that I'm a reporter in my day job, and I use the internet every single day to find people, many people who would rather not be found. And you would be literally shocked if you Googled your own name, uh, you know, maybe using your middle name as well to filter out some results, but you would be shocked of how much of your personal information is already readily accessible online. Your phone number, your home address, your email address. I, there is a ton of information out there if you search for it. And the reason why is because there are data brokers out there who profit by selling your information to robocallers, uh, telemarketers, spammers, people like that who want to learn more about you. And that's why I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura identifies who those data brokers are that are exposing your personal information, and they automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They'll even opt you out of junk mail and telemarketing lists. So I'd like you guys to use our link. It's Aura.com, A-U-R-A.com slash TeamHouse to try two weeks and see how many data brokers are sharing your information. Uh, the link is also down in the description, and there's a QR code that you can scan if you like. Um, so please check them out. You'll get two weeks for free. Again, I think you would be totally shocked to find out how much of your personal information is already out there. So go ahead, do a Google search on your own and see what's out there. And if you don't like how much of your personal information is out there, I highly suggest you check out Aura.com slash TeamHouse to try it for two weeks free and see if they can help get your information private again. That's Aura.com slash TeamHouse to get two weeks for free. The Team House with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. I deployed out to Afghanistan um, that fall after having arrived and uh, met those teams and, and hung out with them and uh, learned what they were doing and ended up spending that Thanksgiving um, out there, came back home. And there was a major operation happening at the time. And I was I was part of the early stage planning out in Afghanistan for this operation. And, and um, I haven't told this story chronologically before, so I'm uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm failing at um, I'm I'm both weighing that stupid NDA in my head that you were talking about, and also trying to remember um, exactly what the true chronology was of it, so I don't get called out and, and misremember this. But this time, this was when um, they had decided that they were going to bring over a guy by the name of Humam Al Balawi, who was at that time in Pakistan and claimed access to the senior leadership of Al Qaeda, and 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 seemed to legitimately have that access. He, he demonstrated that he did have that access, uh, and he was a a possible informant that was going to come across and talk to the CIA. Nobody had ever met him up until this point. And he had come to us by way of another intelligence service, an Arab, intel Arab intelligence service. Pretty sure the Wikipedia article um, articulates this quite well. But uh, so we started to do the planning for that um, while I was out there. And, and th this will be important here in a minute as I move towards the the, the story here. That was a, a shaping feature for me for the rest of my time at CIA. And up until this point, th this very day, I think about this often and, and I make decisions based on what I learned during this period of time. We had this, he, he, he told, uh, he, he was constantly coming up with reasons why he couldn't easily get to this meeting at Coast Base. Uh, and we attributed that to him being kind of a coward. Right. Here, here's a guy that, okay, he wants to do it. He's saying he wants to do it, but he's, he's coming up with reasons why he can't cross the border. And and to be honest, like that was a scary border to cross, <laughs> especially Pakistan to Afghanistan. Like he, he and I would have gotten along as cowards had he actually been a coward, uh, potentially, if that had been true. Um, but of course it wasn't true. Uh, he was definitely not a coward, um, far from it, uh, or at least not the coward that we had been to Maz. Um, I went home. And went back to my desk in Langley, and they finally got to the point where they um, had convinced him, or what they they thought they had convinced him, uh, to come over for a meeting. And he came over for a meeting um, on and, December Aaron, 30th. I'm sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt for a moment, but this yeah, remind, please. reminds me of a past interview. I'm just curious: were you working with Mark at this point? Because he yeah, told so I, he, he told his cow story in in our interview yeah. too. I'm um, yeah. just wondering: so were I, you in the same office? So um, he's very careful um, with his history during this period of time. So I, I don't want to do him a disservice and um, tell a piece of his story that that um, 
that he protects a bit, but you, for sure we were in the same. I, 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 I will just I know. I will just paraphrase real quick what he said. You know, on the show was yeah, that there was please. a uh, you had like a chat program back and forth that you were able to talk to Kaust, and Correct. he t the the story he told was so terrible that you guys were talking and then everything just went silent. And at a yeah, certain so for, point, it became obvious something was really wrong. So for me, um, yeah, so I, I know Mark very well. Um, and, and we've we've commiserated over this story before. And, and, and I got to meet him um, at the location that he was uh, located. I didn't meet him until after this. So I didn't know. Okay, I didn't. Okay. I knew. Actually, no, I guess I had met him. But I didn't spend um, time with him uh, until a good, good, hardcore time with him until after this. Um, so I knew who he was. Um, he was at a different location than I was. But yeah, you're absolutely right. So that day... Um, I mean, it was a big day, right? Like this was a, we, we thought we were bringing in, you know, a potential, and it wasn't an asset at this point, right? This was a, a, a possible, someone who was more like an informant at that point that could potentially become someone who would report on, uh, at this point he was, he, the idea was he was going to report on Ayman, uh, Al Zawahiri, who was the number two in Al Qaeda at that time. And then the idea would be maybe that this would even turn into bin Laden, which was everybody's focus at that, at that time. And so it was a big day. We started the morning. It was morning time uh, in DC, and it was afternoon time out there, and uh, everybody was excited. Like it was, it, it, if you don't get excited about these things in CIA, right, you're, you're in the wrong job. And so, but there was a lot of people involved in this, and uh, I actually had uh, a, a conversation over that system with uh, one of the individuals who was going out to bring uh, Humam al Balawi on the base. Um, I think I think I have this. I think I'm I'm good here. But the, so I'm I'm talking with Harold Brown at this point, and and he's very excited. He's he's like, he's coming. We're good. Let's uh, we're gonna we're gonna go do it. Now that, that that was my last interaction with him, and so I'm communicating this up like, okay, it's 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 rolling out. This is going. There's a lot of a lot of visibility onto this at this point. Um, and then and then you're exactly right. Like we were expecting an update. The update didn't come. It, it, it comms went totally dark, which was extremely unusual. Uh, and we're like, what? What's going on? Can, can, um, can I ask you a question? Um, and I don't know, because I know you were very far removed from this in terms of distance and what was happening immediately on the ground. But from your understanding, was it always the intent to bring him right in? Be, or can, do you know that process? Can you tell us what happened there? So um, let me let me make sure I get all the appropriate stuff out here so I can do everybody the service that they um, deserve when I um, tell this story publicly because it's I I, th I think this is a story that deserves to get told publicly and I and I constantly go back and forth I'm like is it is it my story to tell do I have a piece of this that gets it told should it even be told um, you know are we doing a disservice to the families and I, I battle with this a lot um, in myself um, right now but I, I I ultimately come down that it is a story that needs to be told because there are so many really important lessons in here. Um, and there are so many people that did so many things, right. Um, and even the things that get that help that get held up as being done wrong, in my opinion, um, they, they've been made bigger, um, in hindsight, I think there, there were mistakes. There's ab there were absolutely mistakes. Um, but, but what you're hitting on right now is, is, is should the search have happened sooner? Um, and, 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 and the, the answer is absolutely right. Yeah, it should have been, but I'll, I'll say this, I'll say this right now. Um, searches were not a, that was, it wasn't a necessarily a totally common feature at that point, right? It wasn't like everybody got searched and this guy didn't. Like that wasn't the case. Uh, that ended up being the case that everybody got searched, but it was only after this. Mm -hmm. um, it, lots of people did get searched, but there were definitely, there were lots and lots of exceptions. And most of the exceptions were for really good reasons. You know, uh, CIA is a rapport-based um, organization and, you know, searching someone um, out in the middle of, you know, coast is, is um, a rapport reducer. Uh, but in this case, you know, you, you, that's a trade off you should be able to make and, and really good case officers will tell you, you can earn that rapport back a million different ways. You take that risk for this very specific reason. Um, but yeah, it, there, there was originally a plan, uh, to, to search him that was before that, um, incident. And I suspect, we don't know, unfortunately, um, what, what exactly happened that transitioned that plan. I have, a, I have some suspicions and some ideas. Um, but but they're they're they can't be founded at this point. They're, they're, there's no one to comment on this at all. Um, so he he ends up coming in, and and this is where I can speculate. I think what they ended up doing, but we don't know. Nobody knows. Is that they thought that they would search him closer to the meeting site, mm -hmm. and that, but at this point, right there, the thought process is, 
not that there's at no point did anybody think he was going to blow up the place, right? right. Like, nobody was like, this is what we're worried about. Like that didn't come up. That wasn't even in the risk matrix. Like nobody was like, oh, and there's also this, this possibility, right? It's like, the, you, you want to make sure he doesn't bring a weapon. Maybe he's going to get upset. Maybe he's going to change his mind. Maybe he's been coerced into carrying something on, on behalf of uh, the enemy. We don't know that. Um, I think, or maybe he's a double agent, right? Like, but a double agent from the perspective of like, he's going to consume whatever information he gets out of this meeting and take it back. That's what was really at the top of the threat matrix. So do we give this guy sensitive things or sensitive information about our gaps? Um, and he's going to take them back because that, that happens all the time, obviously in espionage. Um, and yeah, instead of course, um, he gets out of the car, the, the GRS officers, um, go to approach him immediately recognize he gets out on the wrong side of the car, which is, I think, you know, to, for the GRS officers, they, 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 this, the reports from the ground was it was clear that they understood something was going wrong at that point, but it didn't, again, it happened so quickly. I don't think they immediately knew what it was. They advanced on him. Um, and then of course, um, very infamously, he, he detonated a, an enormously huge suicide vest, um, and killed, uh, seven, uh, CIA agents at that time, including the GRS officers that were going up, uh, to get him. Uh, and then, um, two, two, one, one, um, foreign service, or one officer from a foreign service and then one local Afghan commander uh, at that time. And so, um, yeah, that was an, an amazing event, obviously, in the history of the CIA, but also in my personal history um, as sort of having, you know, just had Thanksgiving with some of these folks, having just talked to Harold Brown moments uh, before this happened. And, and, and he was, um, of course, killed in this. Uh, and he's a fantastic guy. I'm just an amazing guy. Uh, left behind a wife and kids and uh, many of them left behind families. And uh, but that one was particularly um, acute uh, for me. I knew, I knew Jennifer and I, knew, uh, I went to training with uh, Liz. Like it was, uh, uh, you know, a, a fellow Ranger um, from first battalion, obviously. Um, and yeah, I didn't know him, uh, but, but, you know, still sort of an interesting way that history comes around. Um and, and, you know, uh, Darren was key to that um, whole engagement, too, and, and for all intents and purposes, was just a stellar officer. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, I'm sure I'm leaving something out here that I, I want to say, but um, so most of the mistakes that make it out here right now, I think people misunderstand them. Um, there's a lot of passion and emotion uh, behind yeah. this. You know, there's a lot of people that give grief to, um, in some cases, people are no longer alive and can't defend themselves. And, 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 and certainly there were mistakes made there on the ground, but at no point was anybody, even the people who were saying, hey, something's wrong here. And there were people who definitely raised their hand and said, raised their hand and said, something doesn't feel right about this, which is a standard feature of, you know, CIA risk mitigation. But at no point was anybody like, hey, I think there's a chance this guy's going to blow himself up. Like right. just didn't, it didn't come in one, not one time. Did anybody say, hey, has anyone considered that maybe he's going to have a suicide vest uh, on him? And I'm certain, I'm fairly certain, I shouldn't say I'm certain because there's no way to be certain, but I, I, I have to feel pretty confident that GRS was moving toward him to conduct that initial search and just had not gone through the calculation of people within 50 meters were at risk um, right. at that point. Of course they were, but um, I just can't imagine that that's, that had to be what was happening at that moment. in, in my opinion, sorry, I went longer on that. No, 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 I was like no, speaking no, to think, but, what, what was going on for you and, and your, your teammates in the office as all this happened and unfolded? Yeah. So, you know, um, a good friend of mine was the chief operations at that time in the in the department, uh, that, and that's the number three there. So senior guy in, in what that time is was the largest department in all CIA, and, and, and still at this point, just like all the things at that time, that was the largest, and there's not, not been a larger um, up until now. And um, you know, we were close at that time, and um, they called us into one of the conference rooms. You know, sort of anybody who was directly related to the op. Um, and yeah, I remember he just, he, he sort of broke down in tears and said, he, 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 uh, Balawi fucked us. He fucked us. Um, and, uh, and then of course he just, you know, he told us a number of casualties, number of people were dead. I don't, we didn't have, I think a full accounting of what was happening right at that moment, but it was, it was already known that a number of people, um, had been killed and injured. Um, and there were people out there at that time who were from the, the department. Um, to support this. So like people who were like, you know, would be in that desk right there um, if they weren't out there with kids and families right there, which I think was all we, what we always thought about. And, um, you know, what, one in particular was was thought to have been mortally wounded. Turns out wasn't, um, but but had a shrapnel go through his brain, uh, survived it. And um, 
uh, continues in the fight today, actually. Um, but, but yeah, the, the injuries were also, you know, massive for some of these folks. And so, yeah, at that point we just consumed that. And frankly, I don't, I don't remember it. I can't remember any of the day, um, after that, as I sit here and think about it, I, I can't remember what we did, um, for the rest of the day, but I think we probably just circled up and started talking about it and trying to figure out, uh, what to do next. What, to, did, what did you guys do next? Like what, what was, what's, what was the fallout from this and how did the agency respond? Well, we definitely built a list uh, <laughs> who we thought was responsible. We were very good at building lists at that time, uh, and it did not take long um, to to build out that list. And I, I will be I will be glad to um, call him out and, and ask him if uh, he wants to come meet me somewhere. There's only one man left alive on that list, and that's uh, Sirajuddin Hikani, who's in the Afghan government now as the Taliban takeover. So um, that man was absolutely in the in the in the the upper level decision tree. Of that and, and he is the i think I, I believe i haven't looked at that list in a long time but i believe he is the the last person standing uh on that list so that that man is a marked man um in my opinion um but he is a little bit untouchable i think right now from mm -hmm. a, a policy standpoint or at least anyway you can imagine um the the the, the tangles that are involved in that but um yeah so we we did we got a list um and then of course you know the, the investigation started i think immediately um into you know what went wrong lots 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 of um conversations about what happened when and and who was to blame and what do we need to do immediately and of course um they they instituted a policy well, they, i'm sure that i think they did a stand down operations but it wasn't long you couldn't do a long stand down operations in that environment and they rejiggered and at that point then everybody had to be searched so they went way deep um yeah. Into the um, the sort of the knee jerk response, which you can't blame them for that. Like that was right. an easy call at that point. Like everybody gets searched for now until we figure out why, why we we didn't do better here. Um, and that stuck around for a long time. Um, and I went back to uh, you know a war zone many many years after that, um, and that policy was still pretty strict yeah. at that time. It had been delegated down a little bit the uh, the ability to make exceptions, but um, you know we were still having to like bring rapport back from like local liaison partners um, who were allowed to carry guns like under our base who would like get searched and like, what are you looking for? I'm carrying a gun. Yeah. Like, um, and you're not taking it from me. I own this land underneath your feet. Um, and so we didn't, that one never really, I, that one's still not calibrated right, I'm sure. But it's also, it's a disappearing what, adventure. Was there, so. what was the environment after that, directly after that, was it, was it very cooperative and understanding? Was there some scapegoating and finger pointing like what what was it like yeah um oh yeah i mean yeah it's certainly finger pointing certainly um scapegoating you know so uh um, this is one of the pieces you know i'm i'm i talk about this a little bit now as you know i when i talk to groups about uh, how to do appropriate risk calculation and you know how to think about risk and then make decisions when you can't totally eliminate risk right and and that that's a really um, hard thing to do. And, and the agency um, failed at it a bunch, but really started to get pretty good at it. And, and frankly, it's pretty good at it um, when you compare everything that they've done over the years and, and not failed at, not had huge catastrophes happen. Um, the scorecard is, is is really good for the agency. But of course, these tragedies, they, they go public and and, the, and you know every time you do a really hazardous mission and that no, no shots are fired, nobody gets harmed, that doesn't go you know in the uh, really awesome column. Nobody sees the really awesome column. Um, and the really awesome column is is stacked mm -hmm. um, at CIA, especially during this time period. Um, but yeah, there are certainly finger pointing. Um, but when I talk about the risk, like the thing that the agency didn't do very well at that time, and, and maybe and I would say it probably doesn't still do that well because it just isn't formed to do this. It doesn't have, it didn't have an ultimate leader at that point for the operation, right? Because this was, this was a, you know, an asset coming onto a base with potential information that was really important. You know, there's lots of people who had a stake in that, mm -hmm. um, you know, senior leaders at the agency who's all the way up to the director whose careers were, you know, make made or, or broken by this all the way up to Panetta. Like, you know, he was tracking this minute by minute. Um, you know, the director of CTC was, uh, was very focused on this, but he, he was not exactly leading it, but he was influencing activities that were happening on the ground. So now you've got a very senior person influencing things, but not responsible for the ultimate leadership. Right. The base chief, you know, quite famously, um, Jen Matthews, who, who I liked a, a great deal. Um, I, I mean, she was a rough, um, she was a, um, not a rough, she was a um, sort of um, 
she grew up in a time in CIA when like women officers were, you know, didn't have, this is where I'm going to like, I'm going to get myself canceled here. If she, I don't, she, if she was like one of the first targeting that. officers, right? She, she was chasing bin Laden in the nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, right. She's one of the first people that came forward with that group of women that said, this guy's going to do something crazy um, before September 11th. Right. She was part of that cabal uh, of women. And I mean, this is when like, it was not easy in the agency to raise your hand as a woman and say, you know, you guys are wrong. Um, and, and we're right. Um, and at that time it really was like, a, it was a group of, I think four or five women, um, at that time that really were like raising the flag here. And, and, um, you know, this story has been told a billion times too, and from 10 different angles. And, and I'm sure I don't have it right because I'm not an expert on this part of the story, but like, you know, they felt like no one was really listening to them. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of people who say, yes, we absolutely listened to them, but like, what were we going to do? Like we didn't have all the information. And so I won't, I won't bring down a, a decision on who was right or wrong there. And I'm sure I've already mistold that story, but she was part of that group. Um, and then she grew up, um, the rest of her time in the organization, um, you know, sort of battling these battles all the time. So she was, um, when I say rough, I mean, she was like a no nonsense person. She was very sharp, super smart, um, knew her stuff. And she's in this, you know, she's now essentially a battalion commander in a war zone, um, which, you know, there are lots of people who ended up in that role that had never been battalion commanders in war zones before, but here she was in a woman, um, in this spot and, and having to deal with, frankly, I mean, majority of of men there that thought that they knew the job better than she did. Um, and many of them, many of them I'm sure did, right. They, they spent entire careers there. Um, but you can just imagine like the pressure that she's in here and now she's got the biggest thing happening in CTC on her base. Right. Um, and, and she is ruthlessly trying to get to the end of this, um, fight with Bin Laden. Like this is her life's mission at this point. So she is really going to push the envelope, um, to make this happen and to make sure it goes right. Um, and so she's just having to make a decision after decision, I think. Um, and again, we can't know, um, unfortunately what exactly, um, transpired there. And there's a ton of people who will line up right now and, and say she, it was her fault. She made tons of bad decisions and that's, that's why this happened. I am not so quick. Mm -hmm. um, to, to take that, uh, position because I can't put myself in her shoes or think about all the pressure she was under and who was calling her. Right. We don't know about those phone calls. Nobody stepped forward and said, yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I called her and told her to do this. Do that. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, and then she got another call and it was someone more senior or latterly senior. Um, you know, and so I really don't know. Um, but, but, but gosh, for, for those of us who've been in those types of situations before, if you don't give the person making decisions at that point, a little bit of grace, right. Um, in this case, obviously like um, a bunch of people are dead and, and, and that's going to constantly be something that people have to think about, um, you know, for the rest of their lives and kids will grow up knowing about, and that makes it hard, but, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not as quick to point, um, fingers at her. If I point a finger at something, it really, I think is, it's the, the feature of CIA that's tricky here because there's just not a leader. Like if this was being run by a JSOC unit, right. There would have been an 06 or something. Um, that would have had ultimate control unless things were going really sideways. The final decisions would have all rested with that 06. Um, they would have done the risk calculation. They still could have made the wrong decision, um, but this, the process for leadership would have been much more streamlined. And when you're dealing with risky decisions, you really do need a decider. Right. Um, you do not need, and, and agency, is, agency is really good because it can um, sort of do things by committee fairly well, where at the end of the day, the only person in in the agency in traditional espionage, it really needs to make a decision is the officer on the street um, when it's sort of game time there and there's nobody to ask. Um, and they want you to be able to act like that. Right. Um, well, that doesn't work in a military environment when the hazard is much higher and you have what effectively is a tactical situation being driven by an organization that was not ever really designed to be a tactical organization, at least outside the paramilitary arm. So yeah, it, it's tricky. It's one that I, I think about all the time. The lessons there are, are plenty. Um, but yeah, when, you, when you're thinking about risk, and you're going to make a risky decision. Someone has to be in charge, and right. everybody has to know that that's the person in charge. And and because this guy, you know, didn't fit like the profile of a suicide bomber, who are who are generally like not as mentally sharp, impoverished, you know, they're, like like there 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 are certain models. But now you're talking about probably what they assumed was a well-placed man in an organization who had access. He wasn't like the courier. He wasn't, you know. Um, and so back at headquarters, probably the idea of risk to them was the risk of pissing him off and not having a source, right? They're this thinking, is true. They're thinking this in, in the terms of human intelligence. Well, we risk 
you know, what's the risk? Not a suicide bomber. The risk is alienating this man and not getting his intel. So yeah, I, I, you're 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 keen in on something. I, I'll say one thing real quick. I would say many of the suicide bombers we encountered in Afghanistan and some of the other places in the ISIS suicide bombers were oftentimes, um, you know, lower educated folks, right. lower economic status, but a t an enormous number of people who decided to kill themselves in the name of jihad were extremely sophisticated, well educated. In some cases, very rich. You know, the 19 hijackers. Um, all came, not all, but predominantly came from fairly well-off families with, with backgrounds you also wouldn't have put in there, right? These were not um, poor people, um, you know, and, and um, other folks in some of the other uh, places that aren't war zones where, you know, Al-Qaeda or ISIS isn't going in essentially saying, hey, if you blow yourself up, I'll give your family, you know, $2,000 and you'll go, right. uh, you know, paradise and 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 you'll live ever after and um, Valhalla essentially. And, um, that, I mean, I don't know what the numbers look like when you compare them up. I'm sure that number is much larger. Um, but you, that's not necessarily the measure. Um, at least that wasn't the measure. I don't think that we were going by there because I think if I looked back, I, I, I'll be honest, anybody who ever asked me, like I was, if I'm being honest with myself and somebody said, Hey, had you been there? And they said, Hey, we're going to move the search point up from, um, the guard post at the gate to GRS in the dusty compound. Um, for some really good operational reasons, you know, operational security, a little bit of rapport, we're still going to search him. I don't know. And I don't know this conversation happened. So there could have been like, no, no search. We're going to bring him right in. I don't know. Um, but had you said that to me and I was out there, if I'm being honest with myself, I probably would have been like, okay, yeah, yeah. this is, I, this is fine. Um, right. we're, we're still going to search him. It's okay. Um, at no point, I, I know for a fact, I would not have thought he's going to blow something up. That's going to launch BBs so fast and so hard. That's going to go through steel beams, um, a hundred meters away. Right. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I think the decision at that point was exactly as you sort of outlined it, where it was like, well, we're doing this regardless. This is what we get paid for. Um, not only what we get paid for, it's what we're expected to do as our duty. And so had someone come in with like a piece of intelligence, in my opinion, and said, hey, you know, the psychologists say, or we've got a little piece of information that suggests um, Balawi could like be considering blowing himself up or like we've, we've looked at the video and it doesn't look like he's actually injured, like he's been claiming. So I, in my opinion, I would have been, I would have come down on that. We're doing it anyways. Mm -hmm. We're going to, we're going to risk it anyways. Now we're going to move the search point well out. Um, and, and we're maybe going to, you know, hazard a, um, you know, an Afghan, uh, private from, you know, the Afghan army who controls the border point, you know, st you're still risking somebody's life, but in a much different capacity. Right. Um, and, and you're still bringing him over. And you're still going to see, is there something here that we need to be aware of? Because the his story, the way he wove it, I mean, he was brilliant. He did a great job um, from the perspective of a double agent. You hear lots of times that he was a triple agent. It's really hard to actually be uh, a triple agent. There requires some high-level trigonometry to figure out what actually constitutes a triple agent. But like, effectively, he was a double agent, right? Um, and he wove that story extremely well. They knew at that point exactly what would get us spun up CIA. They knew how to provide the bona fides that we were going to look at and say, okay, this adds up. This is what we'd expect to see from someone with this level of access. Um, and then a lot of information about his history and how he was recruited and all that sort of broke down or didn't come through or, or people didn't consider it enough as they should have. I mean, in hindsight, it is not hard to figure out where this went wrong. But also in hindsight, when I've looked back at it, I'm like, it's not, it's not even, it's not even that much clearer, right. except that you know he blew himself up, which is right, right, super right. clarifying. Yeah. So as the, the dust settles, literally and figuratively, uh, you remained on the AFPAC account for a while. I mean, what what did they, they have you working through that list that you guys <laughs> just uh, came well, up with? Well, there were many lists that time, right? Yeah, that was, yeah, uh, that, yeah, that was a very, um, that was an effective period uh, in, in America's fight against Al-Qaeda. I mean, if you... Uh,